Welcome back to School Shop. I'm Cameron, and this is part two of my how to build a bar top arcade. Let's get right back into it. When we last left off, we had finished the bottom of the marquee. Then I cut out a strip that is going to frame the marquee after the middle has been removed. So I then used some three quarter inch strips and nailed them around the edge of the frame. I did not use wood glue here because I want to later pull them off since all they're going to be doing is acting as a guide for the router. So unfortunately I did lose that footage of this step, but all you need to do is flip it over and use a flush cut router bit on the inside to create the frame. I also then used a chamfer bit to get the edge a nice looking finish. Um, here in a minute I'm going to use the same technique for making the frame on the monitor. Now here I wanted you to take a look at the marquee of an older arcade I made so you can see why I did it differently this time. By making a frame you can cover up the edges of your plexiglass which could look jagged and unprofessional like you see here. Next sand away the wood filler on your nail holes to give it a nice smooth finish. You can see in this shot that I put some white plexiglass into the marquee but that was just so I could see what it was going to look like, and it looked really good. I then measured out how tall the monitor frame should be, and I believe it came out to about 19 inches. But before I cut it out, I dropped my table saw blade to 45 degrees or so. I cut it out this way in order to make a clean seam where that frame is going to meet the control board. The angle doesn't need to be perfect since it can't be seen from the outside. Initially, I had a pretty good fit, but I then later decided to add some plexiglass on top of the control board, so I did need to shave a bit more off the top of that monitor frame to make it fit again. Next, I hope you're good at math, because it is time to measure out the screen for your monitor frame. Do not measure from the edges of the bezel. Make sure you're measuring from the edges of the screen. Your measurements will differ here based off of what you are using for monitor. So I'd like to pause here and point out that I'm using, uh, this is a 19 inch 720p TV from Best Buy. Pretty nice, pretty cheap, uh, which is great because it looks nice. It has no buttons on the front bezel and it has built in speakers just in case you wanted to use them. However, most modern TVs and computer monitors now use a different aspect ratio when compared to a lot of old school video games. Meaning that your video is either gonna be stretched out or have black bars on the side of your screen, which is kind of negating the size of the TV screen you got. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're deciding what to buy. Unpause. Next, take your time as you measure out your screen, because you really only have one shot at this. It needs to be dead center from left to right, and the space you cut out needs to be the exact same size of your viewing screen. After that, I drilled some holes in the screen area so I could do a rough cutout of this area. I will then come back with my router for my finished cuts. I then used the same technique from the marquee to nail in some guiding supports and then flush cut those with my router. So before you see that, let's pause again. I actually screwed up here by doing everything on the front face of the monitor frame. You can tell it's the front because it's got the clean seam at the bottom instead of that angled cut. This isn't a huge deal, but it created a ton of nail holes under my guides that I later had to painstakingly fill in and sand. You can do it that way if you want, but it's best to keep all those nail holes just on the back and you can't see them. Unpause. From there, flip it over and route it out with your flush cut bit. Woo! Look at those clean straight lines. Looks like a dang CNC machine made that cut. You can then flip it over and pull off the guides. And just like the marquee, I'm using a 45 degree chamfer bit to give the front a more finished look. After that was finished, I laid out my TV with the frame on top of it just so I could see how it looked. And my goodness, does this look nice and clean? It looks like it was made to be there because it was. Let's pause right here. So throughout the rest of the videos, you're gonna see that I have parts that are in various stages of primer and paint. 
I didn't want to film all of that because it's really up to you on when and how you paint each part. I do recommend that if you use spray paint like I did, make sure everything is laying out flat as you paint it so you don't get any dripping. Unpause. So here I'm measuring out where I want to put my speakers. Use your own judgment here because like I've said, these designs are very flexible. I've seen speakers in many different places on arcades. Uh, I then used a very dull hole saw bit to make my cut. Just a heads up, dull bits will burn your wood and burnt MDF smells like death. I then used the same 45 degree chamfer bit on the outside of this hole to give it a nice clean finish. Uh, and it gives it a little conical shape, which I thought, hey, that might help with the sound. Or not, I don't know. Now for the control board, all I did is I went to Google and typed in arcade control board layout, and a lot of different options came up. So then just print out the one you like, do a bit of measuring, and tape it onto your board. I then used my stabby punch all to Mark the center of each button. Don't forget that you'll also need to add a start and select button for each player. And you'll probably need to also add a button that will act as a hotkey when operating your Raspberry Pi. Next, use a one and one eighth paddle or Forstner bit to drill all of your buttonholes. Also, it helps reduce blowout if you throw a piece of scrap wood underneath while you do this. Now for the joystick holes, you only need to use a one inch bit because if you go bigger than one inch, the joystick cover will most likely not cover the entire hole as the joystick is tilted in any direction. So here's another quick painting tip. Make sure you use a high grit sanding block in between each coat for the best possible finish. I also want to make a note uh, that any cut edge, like the 45 degree chamfers on the marquee and the monitor frame, those just drink up most of the paint that gets sprayed on there, and I still don't know the best way to avoid that. Uh, my best luck I've had is just spend a lot of time sanding those edges really smooth before you paint, and also try to do at least three coats of primer with sanding in between each coat on those rough edges. But if you have a better idea, please let me know because I'd really appreciate it. Next, cut out a piece of wood that will be the back of the marquee and where the LEDs are going to attach. You can see that I cut out three quarter inch squares out of the corners so I can fit it over the braces inside of the cabinet. I'm also adding reflective tape to help disperse the light. I doubt the tape made a huge difference, but it's worth a shot. Then choose a corner and drill a hole big enough to fit your LED power cable through. Now most LED strips come in a roll and have labeled spots where you can cut the strip. Lay it out and cut the strips to length. I used three, but you can use more if you need to. From there, you may need to expose the copper leads before you can do any soldering. These strips here are waterproof, so they have a little plastic or rubber coating that needs to be removed. After that, you need to solder the end of each strip together. Positive, positive, negative, negative. I didn't record me soldering because I always get really frustrated while doing it and I didn't think you needed to see that. So after that, use some hot glue to cover up those solder points. This will make things a lot more durable uh, and keep things from being knocked loose in the future. Next, on the back of the monitor frame, I measured out a spot for three screw holes so I can later attach the frame to the braces beneath. In the past, I glued my frame in place, uh, which can make it nearly impossible to make any future modifications or fixes if anything were to break. This is especially important for your control board because if you're going to have any issues, it's probably going to be with your button connections. So you need to make sure you've got easy access. Now the next step is one of the toughest parts, and that is trying to get your monitor screen perfectly aligned with your frame. I really don't have any great advice other than maybe taping it in place before using glue and nails. I used a bit of measurement and trial and error before bracing the TV at the top, bottom, and sides. If you can think of a better technique, please let me know. 
but at least for now, it worked. I then cut some blocks at the exact same height of the back of the TV, and I'm going to use that to run a board across the back to hold it in place. But before I can do that, I need to figure out where exactly the mounting holes are on the back of the TV. So I just poked some holes through a piece of paper and used a ruler to make a square. Then I grabbed some scrap that I knew was wide enough to cover those screw holes on the TV. Then I used a square to get that square nice and square. Then use a punch out to mark where your screws will go. I then used some spare screws that came with a previous TV mount I bought, because if you've ever bought a TV mount before, you'll know that it comes with a bunch of spare screws. Now these screws were too tall, but it doesn't really matter because they are only there to hold everything center. Let's pause again right there. Um, so honestly, you can probably skip this whole mounting it with screws step, because if your monitor is firmly braced on all four sides and then you run a board across the back just like this, it's not gonna go anywhere. You don't need to have screws running into the holes on the back. Unpause. I popped the TV back into place and used a pencil to mark where that back support met the supports underneath it. I later cut the excess off with a bandsaw. I then carefully drilled some pilot holes to the supports underneath so I could attach it with screws. I'm using screws instead of glue and nails, just like I said before, because I want to be able to remove certain parts if they were to ever break. You'll see me do this with a lot of the internal components of this cabinet. Here I've cut out a strip that's going to be the very top of the back side of the cabinet when this is all finished, and I'm measuring out where to put a handle right in the center. However, I might recommend that you put in two handles instead one near each side of the cabinet. The final cabinet was a bit too big to make really any good use of that center handle. You couldn't really hold it very well in any comfortable way. But anyway, take your time with your measurements so that your handle is exactly where you want it. From there, neatly cut out your rectangle with the jigsaw. Now I switch to what will become the bottom panel of the back side of the cabinet and I have two switches and an HDMI port that I'd like to install. So once again, use some measuring skills to draw your cutouts and take it back to the jigsaw. Then the HDMI port only needs a neat one inch circle. And while I had my one inch bit out, I drilled a hole near the corner of one side of the cabinet so I can later add a USB cable for easy access. All right, that is it for part two. I got one more for you in part three. Go ahead and jump on over there.